Hello and welcome to Ways to Change the World. I'm Christian Guru Murthy and this is the podcast in which we talk to extraordinary people about the big ideas in their lives and the events that have helped shape them. My guest this week is the journalist, writer and professor of sociology at Manchester, Gary Young. Named after the Barbados cricket legend, Gary Sobers, his mother came to Britain in the 60s and raised him and his brothers in Stevenage. Gary was, like the song says, young, gifted and black. And he quickly became a star writer at The Guardian. His latest book, Dispatches from the Diaspora, spans a 30-year career based in Britain and America that goes from Mandela to Obama, from Stormzy to Black Lives Matter. Gary, welcome. Thanks for having me. Now, you've been a columnist and a correspondent. I mean, not specifically a, a black writer, but this is very much your black writing. Why, why have you framed it like that? Well, um, it's funny how it's quite often people want to run away from that category, you know, and say, well, I'm, I'm a writer who happens to be black, I'm not a black writer, and I, uh, I'm really happy to embrace it. I did my, my second book was a collection of work about America, and nobody ever asked me, like, why would you kind of collect your work about America? And, um, and here we are, and there is a theme, or there are themes that run through this, it's not like one looks at Nelson Mandela or Mugabe or Obama or Stormzy and thinks, well, what the hell have they got in common? <laughs> so this was something that uh, I, it's, it's never been an issue for me. The issue for me is if people can only see that, if they can only see me as a black writer and they can't see beyond that. But I am that, and I don't think it's, in the words of Toni Morrison, it's not a narrowing category for me. It's a very rich category that involves some of the best literature, some of the best music, some of the most amazing politics and wonderful culture in the world. Why would I not want to be associated with it? Have, have you and have you always had that attitude as a journalist? I mean, that you know, you, you didn't... Because a lot of people in journalism obviously want to mm. kind of shy away from it and go, don't pigeonhole me, I don't just want to write about black things, yeah. I don't want to be an, a black identified columnist. Well, the thing is, most of the work that I've ever done in my journalistic career hasn't been about black stuff, actually. Um, and yeah, my feeling is that that whole thing about I don't want to be pigeonholed hands the power to someone else. It's always in the passive voice, what other people will think of you. And I prefer the Steve Biko embrace that I write what I like. You know, as a young writer, there were the, the older journalists in my life who were also white journalists, they were the only older journalists available kind of to me. Most of them said one of two things, either don't write about black stuff, because you'll be pigeonholed, or you can only write about black stuff. Very few ever said, write about what you're passionate about, write about what you're interested in. It might be black, it might not be black, um, uh, because that's the stuff that you'll write best about, which is always the advice I give to young uh, non-white journalists, is get all that stuff out of your head, all these voices in your head saying, dude, no. write about the things that you are passionate about. If it's race, great. If it's sport or fashion or, or economics or politics, great. You know what? You'll still be black. So, so how, how did you become a journalist? I mean, let's go back to childhood. Right. So your mum came here early 60s. My mum came early 60s. And to be honest, um, I didn't really think of becoming a journalist or writing. The notion that you could live from writing was kind of quite a distance from my upbringing, really. So I didn't know anybody who would do that. It didn't seem like a kind of plausible thing. And it's not like it's something that I wanted to do, but I didn't think I could do. I just never really thought about it. I uh, applied to university to be a translator. My mum had never been to university. Her idea of kind of what a good course would be was something that you could get a job in, you know? So if, if I'd wanted to do history of art and there'd been a degree in plumbing, she'd have said, take the plumbing because you can get a job with that. So I studied um, French and Russian to be a translator and an interpreter. But what I found was that I wasn't that interested in saying what other people had to say, but I had a lot to say myself. 
I love the way that particularly translation forced a kind of manipulation of language. You had to be constantly thinking about words. And those two things came together to think, well, maybe I'll be a journalist. But what about your sense of identity and your confidence as a, as a young black man? Yeah. Did that I, come from mum? Or It came from mum and it came from the kind of, for me, some of the challenges that Britain would throw down to me. That, you know, I was raised assuming that the dominant narrative was always a lie. I was, you know, the, the news that I would watch on a television. And I, I thought they were lying because they were lying about us. They were saying that we were kind of um, thieves and ne'er-do-wells and, you know, drug addicts. And that because we were a single-parent family, we were raised with no morals. So I thought, well, if you're lying about me, you're probably lying about everybody else. So I grew up with a kind of intensely critical view of the world that uh, I, I was in. And, you know, I had to make up an awful lot of stuff for myself. It was the 70s where people, you're at the bus stop and someone's like, oh, it's cold, isn't it? You know, but it's not like this where you come from. And you'd be like, I come from just down the road, mate. So you had to be constantly kind of um, thinking about your kind of, your place in the world and how people understood you, which not inevitably, but kind of um, logically might lead you into something like journalism. I mean, so some of the some of the reviews of your your book have kind of talked about how it's a book about how everything has changed and nothing has changed. Mm. How, how do you feel about that? Yeah, well, I think you know, a lot has changed. I don't think it would be plausible to say that nothing has changed. Actually, I think it would deny some of the most wonderful things and the great achievements that people have made. It would deny the efforts of Doreen and, uh, and Neville Lawrence. It would deny the kind of the urgency of the kind of people in South Africa or the people who helped Man uh, Obama get elected or, um, you know, a, a range of ways, uh, or the Black Lives Matter people, a range of ways in which we are not where we were. Um, the idea of you and me sitting down having this conversation, I think would have been unthinkable 40 years ago. Uh, or 50 years ago, that kind of... Um, so, uh, with, w you know, with the experience that we now have. Uh, or it would be understood to be a spectacle. We're not there. We're not there. And yet, if there's one thing that's more remarkable than how much has changed, I think, is how much has remained the same. The stopping, the searching, the disproportionate everything, pretty much, which suggests that even when black people are not falling foul of the law, they're falling foul of the law of probabilities. Most likely to be this, most likely to be stopped, most likely to be searched, most likely to get longer sentences, most likely to be excluded, and so on and so forth. And one of the things I've always tried to do with my journalism is, is say, you know, it's possible to keep more than one idea in your head at the same time. We can have traveled a significant distance and yet, in a range of ways, we can be stuck. And I, I uh, you know, I feel, I feel that's very true. Well, what do you feel um, has changed or hasn't changed then about naked racism in Britain? <laughs> well, I think, it, I, I think there've been a few changes. One was that, uh, so when I grew up, there were, there were a range of things that were considered fine to say or even if they were considered rude, lots of people said them. So much so that they would have a television show like Love Thy Neighbor, which drew a huge amount of um, so-called humor out of these racial insults. There came a period of, um, uh, in which that was flattened and there was a kind of a sense of politeness that said, you know what? We shouldn't say those things, even if we think those things. Uh, and so naked racism became um, less acceptable. More recently, I feel like we've seen um, the, the kind of skin peel back from that and a return quite often to quite retro um, um, uh, vicious racism. If we think of... And you see these contradictions in something like the Euros, 
and um, the black players in the Euros. And you see them taking a knee and you see um, a range of ways in which that number of black people in a British team, in an English team, when I was growing up would have been unthinkable. I don't think there were black players in the English team for a lot of my childhood. When we played football, and I used to play soccer, it's difficult to believe now, but I did, and my brother, people used to call us Palais. Like there was no black British player that they could relate us to. And then they missed the penalties. And then you see the thing turn, and you, you see it turn and it curdle in a range of ways. And you see that um, that naked racism still exists, and uh, it was lurking for a long time just under the skin. But then you also see the response to that and that it doesn't get the mainstream um, endorsement that it, would have got, uh, uh, that it would have got at the time. Uh, that there is a considerable section of society, white and black, that it's not just that they don't like it, but they won't stand for it. Uh, naked racism, it still exists in a way that 10 years ago, I would have, un I, I had underestimated how much of it was still out there, I think. Um, uh, but it's also important not to underestimate the resistance there is to it. To what extent then do you think that there is a line that you can draw, an easy line between that, between black players being, mm. prom you know, prompting a wave of racism mm. over missed penalties and Obama um, and what followed, and the sort of the culture wars that your your journalism has, mm. has lived through. You know, is, does the success of black people inevitably divide and beget chaos? It doesn't necessarily divide, but there is a pushback. There are a lot of people who are invested in an understanding of black people as being less than, being inferior, being outside. And Obama is a very good example where where um, uh, so any advance that black people make, there will be a response, there will be a reaction, there will be um, an attempt at reversal. And what's interesting is quite often how unsuccessful that is. So um, Obama, and I would say, well, you know, I was there for most of his presidency, and, um, and I used to say, look, race isn't the half of it when it comes to Obama. He is the son of uh, uh, an immigrant. He is the son of a lapsed Muslim at a time when America is losing wars in the uh, Islamic world. He is, had a cosmopolitan childhood in Indonesia uh, and elsewhere, traveling as a young man in Pakistan at a time when America is parochial. He is mixed race at a time when white people are gonna become the minority. Uh, and so in a range of ways, he touches on a series of anxieties. And those anxieties did burst forth and I think were partly responsible for Trump. I think he set, he sent, made a section of a white American society kind of went quite mad uh, uh, about him. Did you feel that in America at the time? When you oh were yeah, no, you could, you could feel it. You could feel it, yeah, very much so. But I would, I would argue that over, if we look over the long period, it was Martin, uh, Martin Luther King said, so the arc of history is long, but it bends towards justice, that kind of um, America did, has become a more uh, uh, popularly tolerant place, generally in its civic life. Um, that those those reactions, while they do exist, there is significant there is significant pushback. And if we look at the Black Lives Matter demonstrations in 2020, um, and who they cohered, a lot of young white people as well as uh, young black people, then we see that there's there's a lot to hope for. With America, it's always very important to understand it was 300 years a slave state. It was 100 years an apartheid state. Actually, non-racial democracy is very new to that country for all of the myth-making that it does. And so we shouldn't be so surprised that we are where we are. And if we are surprised, it's that we've come actually as far as we have in the way that we have. 
your your writing, and and this is a series of you know mm. articles from the time, is is is, is um, plainly critical as well of of those heroes. Yeah, whether that be Mandela or Obama. Um, you know, do you do you feel when you have these moments, having reported, um, you know, on these big big figures, that they will inevitably be disappointing? I don't think it's. I don't, I never think it's inevitable. I think that would lead to a kind of uh, a, a range of cynicisms, but that I think it's very important not to succumb to kind of hagiographic accounts of them, to treat them as the leaders that they are. That, you know, when Obama uh, becomes president and people say, well, you know, we should give him the benefit of the doubt. And I say, he's the president. He has enough benefits already. I'm going to subject him to the critique that I would subject a president from. And I'll be honest with you, that does butt up against some significant uh, uh, liberal resistance. They want to think he's the knight. He's come to save us. They want to think that uh, Mandela is a kind of um, is kind of God's representative on earth. I've I've had people say, "Don't be such an eel. Don't spoil mm. it for us." And I think, like, well, you know, my job is to write about what I see, not to write about. What I would like to see. So, do, so do you think we see these firsts as much more significant than in fact they are? Are they are these men outliers or women, you know, who who are not as significant in their moment as we think that they are? No, I think it's really important to distinguish between the symbolic and the substantial. And symbolically, they are deeply significant. And actually, it's the symbol that we embrace, uh, and that we I think we should embrace, and that we should understand and acknowledge. But then there's the substance, you know, well, what is actually going to change? And that's the thing that's in play. So people would say, you know, my son was born on the very weekend that Obama announced, and people would say, well, this will be a great thing for your son. And I'd say, why? And I'd say, well, isn't it obvious? And I'd say, no. Does he have an agenda that's going to uh, limit his likelihood of being shot or um, jailed or improve his... Uh, possibilities of graduating. So that's what I want from kind of politics, not just someone who looks like him. Let's have a more complex understanding. And once again, it comes down to having more than one idea in your head at the same time. It can be great, symbolically, that Obama is the president of America. And it can also mean that maybe not that much is going to change. The gap between white and black actually grew under Obama in terms of income and wealth and so on. So, but do you think that was his failure? You know, do you think it was Obama's failure that it didn't become any safer for black men at the hands of policemen, uh, unarmed black men, to be right. shot by yeah. policemen? No, I don't think it was his... I, I don't think it was his personal failure. Um, but I do think that... It becomes tricky if you're saying things are now better for black people when they're being shot dead in the street. What Obama proved is that a black man could be president. But then if you look at Black Lives Matter and what happened during the period that he was president, then that also proved that while a black man can be president, uh, a black youth can't necessarily walk down the street without being shot by a cop or a vigilante. Because your, your, your chapter two sort of subtitle is, for all the progress that has been made, at times it feels as if we are standing still, or even worse, going backwards. Mm. And, and, and in some areas, I think um, that, that is what it feels like, you know, that um, if you told me 20 years ago that uh, uh, we would have a non-white uh, home secretary, I would have been amazed if you'd also told me that the Home Secretary was going to be in Rwanda, uh, where they were planning to send legitimate uh, asylum seekers and refugees who came to Britain, I would also be amazed that, um, uh, that you know, some things that are happening, Windrush. I mean, goodness me. You know, the amount of work that I did individually and that others did to kind of feel like, Okay, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna call myself British. I was I didn't call myself British until I was 18, 
And um, just explain that. I grew up at a time when people were telling me I wasn't British. Uh, people were telling me I couldn't be British. And so, and I was also grew up with a mum who put a kind of Barbados sticker on the, on the door and said, you know, outside you're English, inside you're Barbadian. And there was the flag and she talked about Barbados as home. And in the absence of any or, or significant welcoming outside, then you imagine yourself elsewhere. And also there was this notion that either you could be British and only British, and there was one way of being British, and you had to leave all the other stuff, your ethnic and racial identity at the door, or you've got nothing to do with the country. And it took me a while to work out, well, I can be British in my own way, and I can be black and British, and that that's, you know, that is a, a plausible way to be. So when something like Windrush happens, and you see family members and uh, uh, people who could be your aunt or your granny who've been um, uh, deported or threatened with deportation, you think, well, you know, maybe I was a bit hasty. Maybe I was a bit hasty there. So there's a range of things, I think, that, um, that rightly give us pause to wonder, well, how far have we come? So I often think about this in, in terms of, is it that we tell more stories? You know, is it that we never knew how bad things were because these stories never got told and we tried to kid ourselves because we were all in a process of uh, assimilation, if you like, mm. and being British, mm. um, that, that we kind of convinced ourselves that things were better than they were and that now that we that journalism is much more open to all of these stories, we're kind of realizing how much bad stuff there has been. Um, you know, so sort of where, where on the line are we? You know, it, I, I don't know personally whether things are getting uh, better, but we're exposing more of the bad stuff mm. or they're getting worse. Well, and I think it's possible that some things are getting better and other things are getting worse, you know, and other things are staying the same, unfortunately. And if you look at, say, something like police shootings in America, which haven't significantly increased, actually, it's just that we are only now paying attention to what black people have been living with for years. And the problem is that journalists are kind of not failed to recognize it as a problem at the time. It's not like in America, journalists didn't know that black people were being shot dead by the police, but they kind of assumed there must have been something wrong or that kind of, or here's a phrase that I heard a lot when my previous book, which was about all of the kids and teens who were shot dead in one day. You'd call the journalist who'd written the original story and you said, did you follow it up? And they'd say, it's actually not really news that someone would get shot down there. So it then becomes just part of the fabric of society. And so I think, you know, what, it sh what, what that showed was a, a real failing, to your, to your point, that some of, some of the stuff that's now news has been going on for a long time and it just wasn't considered news by the people who make the news. Um, uh, and then there are genuinely new stuff. I mean, Rwanda, that's new, you know. Uh, Windrush uh, felt new. I mean, it, <laughs> interestingly, that was one of those stories where The Guardian's Millie Gentleman, a media gentleman, had been writing these stories for six months or so, and nobody had followed them up. Nothing substantially changed. But I think uh, the rest of the British uh, news media looked at it and thought, yeah, old black people being deported, that sounds about right, nothing to see there. And then at a certain point, they kind of engaged. Do you see Rwanda, just because you've mentioned it a couple of times now, as a story about race? Because obviously the Home Secretary would argue it's nothing to do with race. It's to do with immigration and control and fairness. Yeah, well, um, it's been very rare in British history that immigration has had nothing, issues of immigration have had nothing to do with race. And if we look at, for example, how this government understood the refugees from Ukraine, with how they understand refugees from elsewhere, it's very difficult to say that race is not a factor. And it's a, um, it's a kind of keen political issue. For years, 
when, when they did the polling, immigration stroke race was understood as kind of one thing. The color of people and the movement of people was understood to be kind of more or less the same, uh, the same thing. Now, I don't think immigration is only about race. If we look at kind of some of the anxieties that pushed Brexit, then uh, it was as much about Poles and Romanians um, uh, and Eastern Europeans as it was about anybody else. But then if you look at what happened after Brexit, where uh, there was an escalation in racial violence, then that actually went out to anybody who people decided wasn't British in a certain moment. So th th there's clearly there's a connection between the two. How, how does this sit, though, when you've got um, a brown-skinned prime minister, a brown-skinned home secretary, we've had a... Black, yeah. you know, Chancellor. Oh, yeah. So who was in favour of this? I, see, that doesn't interrupt my thinking about the world at all. And it goes back to my point about Obama, that that's why it was important to challenge the liberal sloppiness about Obama, that this will be a wonderful thing to have a black person. It, there's, what, there's who they are and there's what they do. And who they are, I think it's perfectly possible and proper to celebrate the um, the arrival of a non-white person in Downing Street and um, to say this matters symbolically. And it's then also important to understand, well, now let's look at what they do. And I'm not subjecting Rishi Sunak or Suella Breverman or Kwasi Kwarteng or James Cleverly to anything less than I did to Obama. And, uh, you know, my feeling is what they're doing is not working in the interest of, of, um, of non-white people. So um, it, doesn't, it doesn't interrupt. There's an interview in the book with um, Angela Davis, and she's talking about Obama's impending uh, candidacy. And she says there's, there, is a, there is a version of diversity as the difference that brings no difference and the change that brings no change. Um, that um, uh, this is a system. And if you can have brown and black hands on the system, so long as the system is operating efficiently, then the system will work in the interests of the people who have power. In previous articles, I'd suggested that this was the distinction between equal opportunities and photo opportunities. The difference between looking different but acting the same. I mean, that, that takes me to something else I wanted to ask you about, which you've also written, uh, you wrote an article about, which is in the book, which was about positive action, affirmative action, positive discrimination, that whole mm. arc. And the argument against it, which, which stems from the Martin Luther King quote mm. about the content of your character. Mm. Do, do you mind just laying out that, that whole argument? Yeah. And where you stand on it? That um, uh, if you abstract that quote, which um, people in right, right wing people always do, that, um, you know, it's not about the color of your skin, it's just about the content of your character. From even everything else that's in that speech, where he talks about, we have come here to cash a promissory note. You know, that, that America gave us a bad check and it came back with insufficient funds. That, that this is also in the I Have a Dream speech. And that um, um, we, we want to live in a world where people have equal chances. But because people have not had equal chances, then we have to kind of work on that playing field. We have to kind of work with, like, well, how do we support a group of people who have been held back? So is that King quote taken out of context? Oh, all the time. Yeah, all the time. But if, if, if we look at the breaks that someone like um, uh, a Boris Johnson or a David Cameron has, they go to Eton. They're in the Bullingdon Club, where they make all kinds of contacts. They go to Oxford, which has a connection with Eton and which kind of is uh, Eton being a feeder school for some of these places. Uh, and then they come out and a relative gets them a foot in the door in a national newspaper or in a, uh, uh, in a television company or a marketing company. We're not, we're not dealing with the meritocracy here. So you have this kind of oligarchic <laughs> kind of um, 
uh, world in which um, a range of people who are entrusted to give their view of the world actually have a very narrow experience of it, and that's not healthy for anybody. So when I think about uh, something like affirmative action uh, and uh, um, giving assistance, special assistance, to people who have been denied um, that access, I think, well, you know, this is, uh, it, it, this is at the very least evening things up. And I am really have no problem or shame um, uh, understanding that in a range of ways I've been a beneficiary of a hands up, sometimes because of class, I got a full grant to go to university. When my mother died when I was in university, I got a bit more money. Um, uh, and then uh, at times in terms of race, so the Guardian had a bursary, which wasn't exclusively for non-white people, but did encourage non-white people to apply. That's the bursary I got, and that uh, helped me into journalism. My column arrived in the year of the McPherson report. I don't think that was an accident. But then you have to ask yourself, why had the Guardian never had a black columnist before? So, um, you know, we only want special treatment. I think this is Al Sharpton, because we've been treated specially. How, how do you see um, the way we consume media and newspapers developing and being important in terms of influencing people? Well, it's, I mean, that's really a moving target at the moment. You know, when I think of the way People don't consume news in the way that they did when I started, for sure. And I think I, I left The Guardian in January 2020. I don't think people even consume news now the way they did in January 2020. I think that kind of um, there is, on the one hand, a shift that keeps for things that keep getting smaller and more bite size and uh, sort of more memey and easier to understand and stuff that can fit in 280 characters and so on and so forth. But I think that has also left a significant gap for longer writing that people kind of, um, to use a kind of food analogy, after a while they kind of feel like they've gorged themselves on the snacks and they want to have a meal. And uh, so I, I feel like there's more opportunity to write long than there was. Uh, but th that all too often, you know, there's this thing that they do on Twitter now where they say, do you not want to read the piece, <laughs> you know, before you, uh, before you retweet it? And, uh, you know, people, they tweet a headline. They see a person and they just retweet them. They don't kind of um, consume. So, um, and people now are more prone to getting the news and views they want rather than the news that there is. And commentators, I think, increasingly now write for, um, you know, they're, they're preaching to the choir. Yeah. When, you, when you were writing or when you've been writing columns, are you, are you, do you tend to write for a general audience, for people who might disagree with you or for people who, you know? I don't think there was ever much point in writing for people who agreed with you completely. And that if you were, then you were trying to, or I was trying to often expose something as being more complicated than it seemed. Um, I mean, I, you know, sometimes a choir needs a song to sing. So I don't think that it's, um, it's necessarily a bad thing, not least if you're the only person who's gonna say it. You know, so when Windrush, was going on. Uh, I wrote a column about it quite late into the into the story, but there, nobody else wrote a column about it. And so, um, even if I'm saying, "Isn't this immigration system deplorable?" and all these things that happen, there's still some value in um, uh, in doing it. But I I I preferred the shades of grey to the black and white, by and large. And kind of sometimes, you know, I try and challenge people. So in the, um, in the book, Dispatches, there's um, a column about why riots are sometimes necessary and why 
you know, let's think of the French Revolution. Well, that was a riot blessed by history. That there are all sorts of problems with riots. They're hyper-masculine, they're deeply violent, they are divisive, they are polarizing, but sometimes nothing else is gonna get through. And you have to kind of think about a system that has forced people to that point where they have to do it. You lost your mother very young, mm. and you've written about how you, you, you took her to be to lay to rest in Barbados, mm. her home. Um, in this interview, you talked about how you really only sort of embraced being British in, when you were 18. Mm. Just wonder, as you get older, mm. um, you know, are you sure you'll be laid to rest in this country? I, I, would assume, I would assume so. I would assume so. You never know where your life is going to take you. You know, I had wanted to be the Moscow correspondent for, um, uh, for The Guardian, and then I fell in love with an American, and then I ended up in America for 12 years. I've got two kids who were born in America. I don't know where they're going to be, you know. So, um, uh, to be honest, w when I die, I want to be in the place that's most relevant for the people that are left. But I'd be, I would be happy to be laid to rest here. This is my home. Uh, uh, this is where I'm from. This is the culture that I have, I'm most familiar with. And um, I, would, I would be more than happy to be laid to rest here. And if you could change the world in any way, what would you do? I would want to make sure that if we're talking about the world, then I would want every kid to have health and education, every kid to, to have a, uh, sufficient health care and sufficient education. Without those two things, it's very difficult to survive. And um, uh, in a world with the riches that, given the riches that there are in the world, that is a actually easily plausible thing to achieve. Gary Young, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thanks for sharing your ways to change the world.